ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, coming today and making your time on Zoom and this webinar. Um, my name is Ian Overton, and I'm the Executive Director of Action on Nonviolence. Uh, we um, are shortly to be joined by Ambassador Yan Huang from uh, the French government. Um, and Ambassador Huang will um, introduce uh, the day's event and uh, the speakers and panelists. Hello, Ambassador. Uh, wonderful to see you. Um, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, if there are any concerns, please drop your comments into the Q&A section. Uh, we will not hear attendees on this or see you um, as this is a webinar, um, but uh, any questions you may have in the course will be addressed at the end, unless of course it is a technical urgency. Um, and um, this is the first of five improvised explosive device side events that Action on Nonviolence is uh, working on uh, via UNMAS uh, with the kind uh, moral support of the French government. Um, and uh, we will be looking here at the past, present and future. Uh, in future, uh, we have other events coming along, which is an examination of precursor chemical materials in improvised explosive devices. Um, we will be looking at mine action clearance and IEDs. Uh, we will be examining the cultural and political framing of the proliferation of IEDs. And we will also be um, looking at uh, what future uh, can be done with IEDs. We've all got your email addresses, so you will be alerted to these forthcoming events and papers. The paper that we are presenting today has just been published on AOAV's website, but I will also be sending you an email um, with that paper. And on that point, uh, so we can get into the nitty gritty of the day, I pass over to um, Ambassador, uh, for, and thank you for your, your kind attendance. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Yeah, thank you, uh, colleagues and uh, all the participants to be uh, here today in this uh, virtual side event. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I would like first to, to, uh, to thank very much AOAVs uh, for uh, organizing in a such efficient manner this important first uh, side event on this uh, important topic, which are uh, IEDs. Uh, yes, as you said, uh, uh, Jan, it's the first event on, on, on a, a series of five uh, sides events on this uh, matter. Uh, the idea is to uh, raise awareness of the uh, problems related by, uh, to IEDs and uh, to uh, stimulate uh, necessary reflections of all actors in this, uh, in this, in this uh, topic. When I say all actors, uh, I mean states, of course, inter international organizations, NGOs, uh, private sector. Uh, I think we need all uh, efforts in order to define uh, a multidimensional, operational and, eff and effective strategy to fight against uh, IEDs. Uh, I would like also to thank you because uh, you know that my country is very involved in this subject. Uh, this year, uh, once again, in coordination with Colombia, uh, and uh, we are uh, part of the uh, group of experts on IEDs within the AP2 of the CCW. And this year, together with Afghanistan and Australia, uh, my country is also the um, uh, co-sponsor of uh, and co-author, by, uh, by the way, of the resolution on IEDs that we present every two years in the first committee on, on the UNGA. So this is a first parallel event. It's a very important uh, one um, because, as I said, it creates the, uh, the basis for future reflections. Uh, what is the uh, reality of IEDs? What is the importance of the phenomenon? Uh, what are the victims of IEDs? How many are the victims? And I hope that it will allow everyone to see the uh, very important damage caused by uh, these devices. Uh, in the uh, flyer uh, you distributed, uh, you, you, uh, you can see the, uh, the, the magnitude of the problem. 
uh, in the flyer there is a, 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 a number which is 65,000 civilians around the world uh, killed by or injured by IEDs over the, uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, actually, it was it was a sort of mistake. <laughs> it's more than that, uh, if I uh, understand correctly. But it's 170,000 people who are victims or, uh, of IEDs over the last three years. So it's much more than that. And these figures has been obtained by by the work of AOAVs. And I very happy, uh, I just want to to thank them because it's a, it's a real work to collect these these data. So uh, this first event uh, will uh, also allow us, uh, allow us to go back to the origin of IEDs. Uh, it would be a sort of journey uh, into the past, which allows us to better understand the current phenomenon. Um, thus, the past will shed light on the present of IEDs, what is the current uh, situation. Um, and the present will try to shed light on the future uh, or the very near future with perspectives that will be given to, uh, to us by UNIDIR. So uh, before starting our discussion, uh, I would like just to, um, uh, well, I, I think you, you say that, uh, Jan, but just to um, uh, indicate that it will be a, a good if you can turn off your, your webcam and uh, and you and, and mute your microphone and you if you don't take the floor uh, just to reduce the flow of information it will be it will be good for the uh, for the planet <laughs> uh, and uh, second do not, do not hesitate to ask questions you can use the uh, q and a function in this forum uh, the questions will be asked to the panelists during the q a session at the end of the panel now, um, to start with, I have the, uh, the pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Jan, actually, Jan Overton, uh, who is now very well known. Uh, Jan is the uh, executive director of uh, a, a London-based NGO, Action on Armed Violence. He's also an investigative journalist. Uh, he's the author of an excellent book uh, that I recommend, uh, The Prince the Price of Paradise how the suicide bomber shaped the modern world. And Jan is uh, the man without whom these uh, series of parallel events would not have been possible. So thank you very much, Jan. So uh, I, wish, uh, I would like to just to give you uh, the floor uh, without much ado. Thank you, Jan, uh, for the first part of our panel session uh, conversation. But, uh, Jan, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, so, um, what I'd like to talk about really is uh, the impact of improvised explosive, explosive devices in the last decade. Um, since 2010, uh, Action on Armed Violence has been looking at English language media reports of explosive violence globally. This is available on our website where you can equally search for the impact of IEDs. Um, and there we, we highlight the fact that uh, there's the, the various impacts of IEDs and other forms of explosive weapons on civilians. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the total figures uh, are quite shocking. Um, we put on the, the, the flyer, there were 66,000 um, victims of IDs. This was people killed by IDs. But in total, um, uh, in the last decade, 171,000 people uh, have been killed or injured by IDs. Of these, 137,000 were civilians and 35,000 were armed actors. Um, this means that for every IED incident that we've seen in the last decade, there's been an average of 11 civilian casualties. Um, I, I said in my book, The Price of Paradise, that we live in the age of the suicide bomber, and I maintain that, but I also think we live in the age of the improvised explosive device. Uh, it has uh, had an impact like no other before. 
Um, you can see here the enormous spike in IED harm that we witnessed in 2016 and 2017. There has been a decrease as we've seen uh, organizations like ISIS retreat from the battlefield and be defeated in various areas. There has been a decline, but nonetheless, uh, the, the numbers of people being killed or injured by IEDs today is still greater than those being killed or injured when we began our monitor um, uh, uh, in, in 2010. So the, certainly the, the impact of IEDs is, is not over. Um, the, the, the truth of the matter is that IEDs constitute around 50% of all harm from explosive weapons worldwide. Around 42% of all explosive incidents worldwide were from improvised explosive devices, but uh, they are more harmful, particularly to civilians, than any other explosive weapon type that we've identified. And this salient truth has led me to want to do this report, has led me to work with governments to really highlight at the highest level the global impact of improvised explosive devices. Um, because they, there isn't necessarily much debate and conversation about this pernicious weapon. We hear many other weapon types being debated at the UN, and that is um, noble, but this particular form of weaponry uh, is highly complex and leaves many people scratching their heads as to what to do about it. And hopefully over the next five seminars, um, side events, we'll be able to uh, engage on these matters. Um, so the, 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 the casualties by IED far surpasses all other types. Um, and also uh, the, the impact on civilians is absolutely extreme. Around 80% of all of those killed or injured by IEDs have been civilians. And you can see uh, the, the very large disparity between IED casualties um, who are civilians and armed actors here. And this is primarily because of the propaganda of the deed. Uh, those who use improvised explosive devices um, make an effort um, as, as far as possible to, um, to target civilians. They are purposefully aimed at creating media headlines, creating outrage, and uh, attacking the enemy within. And it's worth noting that of these civilians, the vast majority of those killed or injured will be civilians who identify themselves as being Muslims in the last 10 years. Um, so uh, even though Salafist jihadist groups are perpetrating the attack, they are generally attacking Muslims uh, by and large in their IED strikes. However, armed actors are really impacted by this. Of the 5,413 US soldiers killed in operation since 9-11, where the cause of death is known, 49% of these were killed by IEDs. Their average age was 26, and they were mainly harmed three quarters by roadside bombs. Similarly, of the 634 UK service personnel killed on operation, 43% were killed by IEDs. Again, the average age is 26, and the roadside bombs is 71. We got this from open source data in both the US and the UK. Um, uh, and uh, it took a, a, a very lengthy amount of time to gather this data because it meant having to check every single um, uh, soldier's death as reiterated where the cause of death was known. Um, in terms of um, and, and in terms of comparison of other types of death, you can see that um, the modern militaries, the, gr the greatest threat of all weapon types to modern militaries is the IED. If you strip out other forms of death, like a death by accident or self-harm, um, actually it becomes even greater. The IED is the greatest threat to the US and the UK in the war on terror, as this has shown, and to other nations who are fighting that um, so-called war. Um, children, uh, when we're going back to civilians, have been consistently the casualties of uh, IEDs. This is over three and a half thousand children, if recorded by English language media, were iterated. Uh, of that, um, the majority are in Afghanistan, as well as many in Syria and Pakistan. Um, th certainly, there are groups that do not consider children to be um, out with the atrocity of war, that actually they are targets. The Taliban, ISIS, and IS in Afghanistan have consistently targeted areas where, where children. And uh, we also saw it in Iraq as well, where there were even things like chocolate boxes laid out in the street 
with an IED inside, so when they blew up, a, a child taking the chocolate would be killed. Um, and you can see, uh, again, the sheer burden of children in Afghanistan, Syria, and Pakistan taking the main threat of IEDs in this area. Um, in terms of gender, where casualties were known, um, we saw at least uh, 2,000, uh, two, around 2,200 women as casualties of IED violence. Where their gender was known, they constituted around 14%. I think this is largely reflective of the fact that in areas where IEDs are often used, such as Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and Syria, against women, uh, these are areas also where women uh, do not have a very high profile in the streets. They're often house uh, remaining in their homes. And so um, many markets would be proliferated more by men. So when public areas like mosques and markets are targeted, the vast majority of those killed or injured will be men. Um, but certainly we do see in places like Nigeria, um, both women targeted explicitly, as well as being the perpetrators of IED harm. Overall, uh, in terms of location, we found IEDs uh, in over 100 countries, in 100 countries. Um, some 504 incidents were registered in Europe and North America with 5,700 civilian casualties. Um, of the uh, total number of events, of the 12,000 we saw, uh, um, around 60% took place in populated areas. And when IEDs were used in populated areas, 90% of the victims were civilians. Uh, so you can see that populated areas are certainly a, um, a, a major um, concern of um, IED pop, um, usage. Um, in terms of the perpetrators, um, ISIS, Taliban, Al-Shabaab, and Boko Haram were the main perpetrators of IED attacks, where um, it was known who was under attack. It has to be said that there are an awful lot of attacks that occurred where we do not know who the perpetrator was, but often one makes a second guess in these areas, although we do not record this on our data set. So I'm only listing where we know exactly who the offenders were. Uh, the Islamic State clearly um, have been a major component of IED proliferation in the last decade. Um, just interesting to compare it to different weapon types. We have seen a huge proliferation of IEDs. Um, they, there are more IEDs used than ground launch weapons or air launch weapons or landmines. Um, the IED is uh, the main dominant singular weapon type, um, if you can call it a weapon type, because it is improvised and therefore has different functions. Um, but uh, in terms of the specific types of IEDs that we've seen, um, the vast majority were non-specific. Um, maybe that's because of reporting, but we, we had to, and suicide bombings is included in that non-specific. And, um, and then you see um, uh, a, a number of car bombs, uh, roadside bombs and car bombs. So the non-specific, which includes suicide bombings, is the main leading, but then followed by roadside bombs and car bombs. Even though roadside bombs were the main reason that US and UK soldiers were killed in the war on terror. Uh, one thing which I am very focused on is the fact that the suicide bombers have proliferated extremely in the last uh, decade. Um, in 1973, for instance, there wasn't one suicide bomber in the entire world. Um, in the last 10 years, we've seen 47 countries impacted by over 2,000 uh, suicide attacks. In Afghanistan, Iraq, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Syria, I've seen a huge proliferation. We may not see it on the daily news today, but trust me, when you look into the granularity that we do, suicide attacks have not gone away. They are still repeatedly being used um, in countries that may not get as much global news coverage as one hopes. And one of the most shocking things is I did an entire examination of all the people killed by suicide attacks since 1881. And 40% uh, of all the people killed have died in the last seven years. And I think this really demonstrates the sheer ubiquity of suicide bombings. Um, uh, and um, again, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Nigeria really show um, just where many of them are being used. Um, all of this uh, information can be found on our website, aoav.org.uk. We've placed the main report for today on that website. Um, and um, I'm more than happy to take um, any questions um, if you want to email me um, uh, at um, uh, via OAV and my contact details can be found back. And now um, I will pass uh, to uh, back to the ambassador to introduce uh, Roger Davis uh, taking on the history of the IED. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Jan. And uh, well, I, I must say that uh, I'm always impressed by the, the quality of this data collection uh, you succeeded to, uh, to provide to, uh, to us. Um, with a lot of numbers uh, that make us more aware of the, uh, the amplitude of the problem. Um, I just want to, to, just to, to note three of them, 170,000 people recorded as IED's victims, 80% of the victims were civilians, and half of all armed from explosive weapons worldwide. So how did it come to this? And this is the, the question that we are going to ask to the second panelist, who is uh, Major, Major Roger Davis. Uh, I'm very happy. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Um, good Major, afternoon um, Major Roger has been involved in various aspects of terrorism response since 1985 as a soldier first. Uh, he was a bomb squad commander, uh, was an intelligence analyst and is also a businessman. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, welcome to a, to a uh, event. Um, so uh, the, the floor is yours, Major. Uh, please uh, give us some um, uh, insight of the history of the ideas. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the history of, of IEDs, a history that goes back a thousand years and obviously in 15 minutes um, uh, I can't hope to, to, to cover everything. Um, uh, first let me touch on uh, the definition of an IED which I think is important uh, today um, um, but perhaps in the past uh, there was a, a much uh, uh, vaguer boundary between the two until munitions were uh, produced in mass in factories, then every explosive device was, a, was an IED. So um, I would say, historically speaking, the, uh, the definition uh, of what is an IED and a munition isn't too important historically. Uh, but I want to talk about how uh, technology is a key enabler uh, for IEDs throughout history and still today. Uh, and also, um, it's driven by uh, the changing nature of politics, and I'm going to touch on, on those and at the end of the day, the ability of humans to communicate and pass information between themselves and the ingenuity of, a, of an individual uh, IED user. Um, there were a series of uh, developments uh, over, over time. Um, uh, there were developments uh, of exp uh, explosives, uh, mechanical components, uh, electrical components, uh, uh, electronic developments as well as the political factors and the hu other human factors. So I'm going to talk about uh, um, a, a range of those uh, as we go through uh, history. Um, firstly, uh, low explosives. If I can go to the next slide. Um, low explosives, uh, and this I'm starting off with gunpowder uh, in the main, was developed about a thousand years ago in China. Uh, and at that point, there was a, a mix of, of uh, um, uh, a nitrate uh, as an oxidizer and a fuel of charcoal and sulfur that uh, um, some individual Chinese probably discovered uh, by accident. And when that uh, uh, mix of chemicals was wrapped in a, in a paper container and then ignited, it created a, a, a loud explosion. And the, and the Chinese were, were great uh, users of fireworks uh, and so um, uh, gunpowder started around that time there. Uh, over time, the mix improved uh, and uh, the uh, container in which the explosive mix was contained uh, changed between uh, paper and then wood, probably bamboo, uh, and then clay and then, and then metal. And each time the initiation uh, was uh, by burning fuse. It's important to understand that the low explosives um, sorry, just go back to one slide. Uh, low explosives, the chemical reaction of, of the fuel and the oxidizer working together um, uh, is propagated through the explosive uh, uh, by fire. So it burns and it burns extremely rapidly and produces a large volume of gas. And it's that rapidly produced gas that causes um, the, uh, the explosion. Obviously, when it ruptures a, a container, uh, then that uh, uh, creates uh, um, um, a noise uh, and projects the uh, components of the container. So uh, that's how simple uh, explosive devices uh, work with low explosives. Um, Gunpowder was developed through the, the centuries that followed and there were, there were various overlaps. Um, 
one particular um, set of uh, uh, circumstances that improved over the years was uh, uh, mechanical developments. Um, improved um, uh, or the ability to um, initiate explosives with mechanical means rather than the man lighting a match and throwing it at a, at a fuse or, or igniting a train of gunpowder uh, can be improved with mechanical developments. And much of this happened um, uh, in Europe uh, 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 in the centuries that, that followed. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, uh, images there. Uh, the one on, on the uh, left uh, is from about 1582, and that shows uh, a wheel lock mechanism. This was a, a mechanism used to initiate firearms, but can also be used to initiate explosive charges. Essentially, the mechanical advantage here is that a piece of string is attached to the, a trigger from a firearm, uh, and when the trigger is pulled, for instance, from a great distance, uh, then that uh, causes the wheel lock to function, causes a, a wheel to spin round on a, on a spring, uh, that creates a spark that then ignites a, f uh, a fuse to a, uh, a barrel of gunpowder. Um, now that pull can be either uh, deliberate by the perpetrator or, or not deliberate by uh, a victim. So uh, you've got the start there of, of uh, complex command uh, devices and also complex booby traps. Um, just by the addition of, of a mechanical development. Uh, the wheel lock was developed in about 1500, perhaps even by Leonardo da Vinci, uh, and was still being used to initiate explosive devices uh, throughout the 1500s. Uh, the diagram on the right is actually uh, extracted from a French uh, technical investigation of, a, of an English IED. Uh, this is an IED uh, that was built by an American, Robert Fulton, working for the British, um, and uh, it uh, was placed on a raft containing a large volume of explosives um, and that drifted down towards um, uh, uh, the French fleet um, uh, on the north coast of, of, of France. It failed to go off but the French recovered the device and that uh, fantastic diagram uh, describes how the timing mechanism uh, of that device worked. So here we've got the step on from the wheel lock and we have a flintlock mechanism um, which is actually a simpler uh, and more uh, economically efficient uh, uh, div uh, mechanical device for initiating explosive charges. Um, during the 1700s, electrical initiation was developed and one of the first people to do that was uh, Benjamin Franklin, who managed to initiate gunpowder with an electrical charge. Uh, it wasn't very much uh, used in IEDs, to be honest, until uh, the, perhaps the latter part of, of the 1800s, but certainly um, um, uh, Samuel Colt uh, was using electrically uh, initiated devices um, it, during uh, uh, his time uh, and shows how uh, ingenuity developed uh, and battery technology continued to be uh, um, developed and in the 20th century it's a, it's a key uh, mechanism for igniting, uh, initiating uh, uh, IEDs. Next slide. Uh, che chemistry has changed. Um, we, we, high explosives were developed largely during the 1800s, but one or two precursors before then. Uh, high explosives operate uh, instead of burning, like in gunpowder, uh, the shock wave causes the, um, uh, the chemical reaction. Um, uh, detonators and blasting caps are, are very sensitive and generally they're used to initiate um, uh, uh, larger volumes of, of more, more insensitive explosives, but uh, there's more energy going in there uh, and more effect uh, with as chemistry developed. Next slide. And then of course there's electronics and, and in the modern world uh, uh, radio control is, is uh, pretty common. It really started to come out uh, in the early part of the last century, but these days most IEDs or a large number of IEDs have some sort of electronic components and also the development of electronics leads us to the future. And that uh, on the left hand side is a, is a drone uh, carrying an IED on it. So it, uh, electronics has allowed greater accuracy and uh, a range of other capabilities. Next slide. And then there's availability. Um, there is a, 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 these days with the internet, uh, uh, the knowledge of how to make an IED is, uh, is uh, uh, easy. Uh, in the 1800s, there were, there were dynamite schools in New York, would you believe, uh, developing uh, the knowledge of, of explosives. Uh, 
and of course availability can also apply to the battlefield in terms of uh, availability of munitions to turn into IEDs and the picture on the on the right there is a, a shell recovered um, and used in an IED in uh, 1935. Next slide. Tactical developments, um, not much time to, to cover these, but uh, in particular, I'd like to focus on the 19th century, that's the 1800s, where the revolutionary politics of, of, of anarchy and revolution um, uh, encouraged individuals to turn to explosives to uh, propagate the propaganda of the deed. Um, but of course, they were also used uh, in, in, uh, um, in the military world. Next slide. Uh, just a few pictures here to show a, a progression. I apologise, Mr. Ambassador, there's a lot of French ports here getting attacked with uh, IEDs, but uh, from China in the 15th century, this is a shipborne device uh, through Antwerp in 1584, where a thousand um, uh, Spanish troops were killed in a shipborne IED, on through uh, Dieppe, uh, San Marlo, uh, and indeed on to uh, San Nazaire in 1942, all shipborne IEDs showing a progression through the years. And finally, on to the next slide. Again, some historical vehicle-borne devices. Uh, the attempted assassination of uh, Napoleon in 1800 uh, um, on the Rue saint Nicaise in Paris. Um, there, were, there were earlier vehicle-borne IEDs. You can see the carts below it. And more, more recently, of course, uh, Wall Street is, is often seen as the first uh, vehicle-borne IED, but it's not. Uh, and uh, even some forgotten one, forgotten one. So we have a, a, a truck bomb in Jerusalem in 1948. I'm sad to say, uh, placed by British deserters acting as mercenaries. Uh, on to the last slide, I think it is. So history of IDs go back goes back a thousand years. Various bits of technology have enabled it. Um, IDs are used by both uh, uh, the military and also to to progress political imperatives. Um, IDs are not going to go away. Uh, they, they continue to surprise us. Every a few decades, people rediscover the importance of IEDs. If you'd like to know more history, then the website there has many more examples. I'm happy to answer questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Major. Thank you. Uh, it was thank you very much for for this uh, very very interesting presentation. And uh, really, I invite everyone to go to uh, to uh, Major Rogers' site uh, website. He has uh, ex uh, an extremely well done website um, uh, with a lot of details, presentations, a lot of that that has uh, actually uh, of the. Uh, history of IEDs. Um, so this IED history continues today and uh, in, in, in this uh, century, uh, in the 21st century, but what our third panelist, Dr. Louis Tumchevich, uh, will present. Uh, Louis is well known in our, in our uh, community uh, uh, dealing with, uh, on the fight of IEDs. She was part of the, the panel that we organized uh, last year in, uh, during the first committee. She's an historian uh, with a particular focus on counter IEDs and on uh, explosive ordnance. And we've also a wider interest across a, a, a large range of defense related topics. Uh, she completed a PhD in war studies at King's College London. Uh, so um, I will just give the floor now to, uh, to Louis. Please, Louis, uh, give us some uh, insight of what is the, the current situation. The, uh, the title of your presentation, presentation is Why did the IED become defined 21st century warfare? Louis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. It's a pleasure to be speaking today. Um, as Roger explained in detail, IEDs have been used as weapons of war and protest for nearly as long as explosives have been in existence. But, however, over the past quarter century, we've really seen IEDs becoming the weapon of choice for insurgencies and violent extremist organizations, really becoming almost the definitive weapon of the early 21st century. 
uh, the as Ian has, has detailed, they're responsible for the death and injury of thousands of people annually, many of those civilians. And the question that we'll, that we'll touch on today is why? What are the reasons for the resurgence of IEDs? And I would say, start by saying that the, re the reasons for the resurgence and the particular prominence of IEDs are multiple, they're intertwined, they're overlapping, we could spend far more than 15 minutes uh, describing them. Uh, but we'll what we'll touch on today are several factors for this rise in IED use. Um, slide please, Ian. We'll look at the roots of explosive violence, um, the characteristics of contemporary extremist groups, the nature and character of IEDs, and the advantages offered by modern communications, trade, and technology that make IEDs a preferred weapon system today. And finally, to conclude, um, I'll mention some possible mitigations that will be taken up in far more detail um, by subsequent panelists in following um, side events. So the roots of contemporary IED violence lie really in the instability and state collapse that has plagued many countries around the world since the end of the Cold War. We can see a pattern, um, certainly in places like Afghanistan, Somalia, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, where extremist groups have exploited the collapse of the state and resulting civil conflict. And this extremism has been further aggravated by rising sectarianism across the Muslim world, um, where Sunnis and Shia communities have turned rather from state institutions to their family, to their tribe, to their religion, for a sense of identity and protection. And this, this retreat into these identities promulgates the fear and hatred of of the other, and that feeds very well into extremist teachings. Uh, in northern Nigeria and around the, and the surrounding Lake Chad Basin, IEDs have become increasingly prevalent. What we see there is weak states struggling to contain distant peripheral regions. Uh, economic underdevelopment and poverty create conditions for instability to thrive. And also the impact of climate change threatens traditional livelihoods, exacerbating long running intercommunal fissures. Extremist groups have grafted themselves onto local dissident movements, conflating their local grievances with the wider cause of global jihad. Now, growing interstate competition has also contributed to the rise of extremist movements. There's competition for regional hegemony in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf, which has complicated efforts to resolve crises in the region in which extremist groups thrive. And the state competing states also use extremist groups as proxy forces against rivals as a means of fomenting instability and extending regional influence. And we'll discuss that a little bit later on in this presentation. A slide please, Ian. So we have seen a rise in extremism in the past 25 years, um, particularly Salafi jihadi extremism. Now, I think it's important to note that not all extremist groups are the same and there's significant differences between various groups, their strategies, their direction, their tactics, their targets, and even the IEDs they use. However, nearly all aim to return society by force to an unadulterated, authentic form of Islam by fighting a violent holy war or jihad against those that they perceive to be their enemies. Now, many, many Sunni extremist groups draw ideological inspiration from Salafi jihadism, which is a blend of fundamentalist Islam and Sunni Wahhabism that emerges in the 1970s. However, it's really important to see Salafi jihadism not as a religion and certainly not representative of Islam as a whole, but rather much like other radical ideologies that Roger mentioned, um, has a really extreme response to the turbulence and upheaval of the modern world and a violent rejection of modernity. Uh, like earlier radical ideologies, um, 
Salaf and jihadism draws very, very clear distinctions between its followers and those who reject its doctrine, um, labeling them infidels or apostates, even if they do happen to be fellow Muslims. Uh, this labeling means that people can therefore be legitimately killed in the context of jihad. And we see that expansion in targeting, and we'll discuss that a bit further on. We also see the notion of martyrdom um, as being a particular, uh, of particular virtue, and that contributes to the use of IEDs in the context of suicide bombings, which has been a particular feature uh, of the past 20, 25 years, particularly the past 10 years. Um, we addressed that in, in um, a side event last year. And of course, Ian is, the, is really the expert on that topic. And I'd refer you to his book for much more detail on that. Um, slide please, Ian. Now, I think it's really important that we understand, and as Roger has very clearly articulated, that IEDs are in no way the invention of recent extremist groups. Uh, they've long been a preferred weapon of dissident groups because they offer accessibility, an element of deniability, ease of assembly and use. You know, IEDs can be fabricated relatively easily from an assortment of household items, um, in agricultural fertilizers, relatively common chemicals, or by altering and adapting conventional weapons. Um, the, both the surface and the dark web are tr provide troves of information on how one might concoct an IED as well. But one of the most dramatic shifts that we've seen in the past 20 years is the, is the dramatic increase in the scale of IED production and use. Since the Iraq war, IEDs have been produced in far greater quantities uh, than ever before. Uh, most notoriously, the Islamic State created a series of IED factories throughout their territory where they were producing devices on a quasi-industrial scale. Um, and a similar mass production of IEDs has occurred in Yemen. And this ability to produce weapons reduces reliance on conventional weapon systems, but also provides a vast and almost renewable arsenal of deadly weapons. Now, this mass production of IEDs has been facilitated by the ease and global nature of trade. The acquisition of component materials is easier than ever before. And porous borders and the collapse of customs and policing authorities in failed and failing states enables the passage of large quantities of goods to go undetected. Now, the ubiquity of component materials also affords the perpetrator a degree of deniability, or at least until some weapons uh, forensic analysis can be undertaken. Uh, during the Iraq war, we did see uh, some covert support uh, for Shia militias through Iran uh, with the passage of technology. And we've seen that again in Yemen. And upon examination of some of the component parts found in Yemen, there's actually a deliberate attempt to obscure their origin to avoid tracing where they might have come from and who might have supplied them. Part of the enduring appeal of IEDs is, of course, the propaganda of the deed, of uh, the impact of the act of violence being greater than the actual act itself. Now, in the 19th century, as you can see from these line drawings on the slide, um, when the first, when the phrase propaganda of the deed was first coined, news of IEDs attacks traveled by newspaper, by telegraph or letter, and would have reached a public audience days or weeks after the event, and the horror of the event being conveyed in drawings or very early photography. However, today, images of IED incidents can be beamed around the world almost instantaneously via social media and, of course, 24-7 news coverage. These dramatic images of explosions spark fear and outrage, developing the notoriety and fearsome reputation of the perpetrators. Online platforms and secure messaging services have also facilitated the recruitment of thousands of disaffected young people often young men, but also some young women, who are often members of diaspora, Muslim diaspora communities, really long for a sense of belonging and purpose 
who were, who were really lured into extremist organizations that promised to give them precisely that. You know, beyond the propaganda impact, we do see IEDs wielding significant political effects, which increases their popularity with those using them. In the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as Ian's statistics have shown, IEDs were the preferred weapon against coalition and, and NATO troops uh, used in vast quantities and to varying levels of technological sophistication. The numbers of IED casualties led to calls for troop withdrawals and renewed domestic criticism of continued military engagement. The requirement to, to, pro, to protect troops also led to billions of dollars of investment in new equipment, driving up the cost of the war considerably. What this showed, however, was that IEDs, low cost devices made of common household goods, readily accessible, accessible consumer items, could effectively counter the most sophisticated military forces in the world. They're a tactical weapon with very strategic effects. Now, in 2014, the Islamic State further demonstrated the destructive potential of IEDs by combining conventional tactics with unconventional weapons and used that in their campaign to gain territory through Iraq and Syria. Uh, this battlefield success, uh, which was fortunately temporary, um, further evidenced the potential of IEDs to thwart conventional armed forces in the field, confirming their utility both as a weapon of war as well as a tool of terrorism. Now, the nature of, of contemporary extremist ideologies has really expanded the targets of IED attacks, as we can see reflected in AOAV statistics. Uh, looking back through history, we can see that political leaders such as Napoleon or Tsar Alexander of Russia, um, security forces, symbols of economic wealth and political power, have often been targets for explosive violence. And that's often been part of a wider campaign for concrete political or economic change. But over the past 20 years, we've seen a shift from this more precise targeting to deliberate mass casualty events, beginning with the attacks on the World Trade Center on 9-11. The pursuit of jihad as a means of attaining a utopian society, as opposed to a more inclusive political system or a recognized homeland, for example, has been used as justification for the deliberate killings of innocent civilians whether that's in Iraqi marketplaces, at an Afghan wedding, on Spanish trains, or in British concert arenas. We see also a rising humanitarian crisis as the widespread of sowing of IEDs in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere um, creates an obstacle to populations returning safely to their homes, a danger to children who might pick up weapons in the street. Uh, and public spaces that are contaminated with IEDs. Slide, please. Okay. And that's just, that slide's just summarizing everything there. Slide, please, Ian. There are some common items that have been found uh, actually in Iraq and Syria um, where the Islamic State had factories. So really quite ubiquitous ordinary items being turned into weapons. Slide please. Now, is there a solution to the IED problem? Well, the very nature of IEDs being adaptable, versatile, easy to assemble, makes them an ideal weapon. And really over the 20, past 25 years, they've been shown to be really effective at countering military forces, at generating this sort of international fear or media attention uh, that has really allowed extremist groups to expand their profile and influence. Looking at their relative success over the past 25 years and looking back at wider history, we can see that IEDs will probably never be completely eliminated, unfortunately. However, states can take a range of measures, which will be discussed in subsequent side events, to control and monitor the movement of precursor materials, thereby reducing the accessibility and volatility of some IED components. 
However, the growing use of IEDs over the past quarter century is just merely symptomatic of the underlying causes of violence and violent extremist organizations, their roots in chronic and persistent instability, and the breakdown of states and civil society. The slow, gradual, and almost generational efforts to improve access to education, employment opportunities, and strengthen state governments may help redress grievances and reduce the conditions in which extremism and violence thrive. IED attacks do not significantly decrease until these root causes of vehement discontent are effectively addressed. Um, thank you very much, and I really look forward to the questions later on. Yeah, thanks to you, uh, Louise, and thank you very much for uh, for your presentation, but uh, in particular for your for your last slide, uh, whereby you propose some uh, uh, possible solutions to uh, to mitigate the, uh, the this problem. Uh, one is to uh, for greater control of precursor materials. It's something that we uh, indeed are looking at uh, in the uh, in the, in the uh, international community and diplomacy. And the second one is how to address the uh, the, the roots of extremist violence, which is a, a, a real uh, broader problem. Um, turning now to uh, the next and last panelist. Um, who is Alfredo uh, Malaret Baldo. Um, I'm sure that some of you know him. He's, uh, he works for the Unity. Um, uh, Alfredo will also suggest some ways to fight against IEDs. And he, he will uh, describe a, a very practical tool, the self-assessment self tool that uh, Unity has developed in recent years. This is a, a tool which is designed for states and, uh, well, I, I take this opportunity to invite all states to use this tool because I think it will be particularly uh, useful. Uh, Alfredo, the floor is yours. Please uh, tell us more on that uh, uh, self-assessment tool. Ambassador, fellow panelists, it is a pleasure to be speaking today and thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to present the Unidir Counter ID self assessment tool in this important session. My name is Alfredo Malared. I'm a researcher at Unidir, and I want to build on strategies to counter IDs. Next slide, please. First, I want to start by introducing Unidir. We are an autonomous institute within the UN. We are a think tank focusing on disarmament and security. Our goal is to assist the international community to develop the practical and innovative ideas needed to find solutions to critical security problems, such as the evolving threat posed by IEDs. Next slide, please. Now, the reason for my presentation today, what is the UNIDIR counter ID self-assessment tool and where does it come from? UNIDIR was requested by the General Assembly to develop, and I paraphrase, a voluntary tool to assist states on IEDs. Pursuant to this request, and with the generous support from the government of France, we developed an accessible, easy to use tool designed for states to self-identify challenges in preparedness to counter the threat posed by IEDs. In developing this tool, we have consulted a global network of stakeholders, including hosting two review meetings, distributing the draft to over 70 experts for feedback and carrying out two pilot tests to ensure the tool is fit for purpose. Next slide, please. So what are the ultimate objectives of this tool? Well, based on the gaps and challenges identified after conducting a self-assessment, the objective is to leverage knowledge to enhance prevention and response strategies. It could also help define the priority of work and gauge the likely, likely scale of financial implications. Next slide, please. Now, how is the tool organized? Well, in a nutshell, Components of counter ID are divided into two broad categories upstream activities, those aimed at preventing ID events, and downstream activities, which are associated with a response to ID events should one occur. Uh, just one click again. All right. The basic premise of the tool is that the more mature the prevention measures, the less response measures will be required. Next slide, please. Now, to discipline the range, of all the possible counter ID activities, we have maintained the concept of upstream and downstream components. This slide 
shows the activities outlined in, outlined in the tool. You will see that not all the activities are focused directly on the ID event. This is because other measures, such as risk education, border controls, controls on precursors, how it was just mentioned, among others, are also important, but often overlooked. And that is why we have placed significant emphasis on the whole of government approach to countering IDs. In the tool, the effort to assess these activities is structured around a capability maturity model, or CMM for short. Next slide, please. Now, what is a capability maturity model? And I think we can define the CMM as a set of structure levels that describe how well the current practices can reliably produce required outcomes. The main benefits of using this structure is that it provides a baseline or benchmark for the basis of comparison and also indicates critical gaps and areas where process improvements may be required. Next slide, please. This graph presents the five maturity levels utilized in the self-assessment tool. To illustrate the range, for example, level one initial indicates that the approach to countering IEDs is not well defined and it is conducted by units responding with minimal training and equipment and not in accordance with a nationally defined policy. Or level five, optimizing the other end of the range, signals that the state has fully functioning cohesive structures which can deal with a complete range of ID events and international cooperation is mature. Next slide, please. Now, how to use the tool. The most important step is to assess each counter ID activity identified in the model. The tool provides questions and guidance on assessing each activity against the five different levels of maturity. For example, on risk education, are awareness messages updated as a threat posed by ID evolves? And this is followed by criteria to situate current practices in the corresponding level of maturity. Then, after assessing each activity, the users reach consolidated results for upstream and downstream components. Results can be used by states to establish a baseline of cap capabilities across the prevention and response cycle. Then prioritize efforts to improve capacity and maximize international cooperation and information sharing. In this last aspect, I would like to highlight the importance that the tool can have in aiding regional efforts to develop coherent regional strategies against IEDs. Now, to be clear, information generated by the tool can be useful for states to improve national practices, but also for states to utilize in dialogue with regional partners. And please note that the tool is voluntary and involves no reporting requirements. Next slide, please. How does using a tool look in practice? To facilitate self-assessment efforts, a simple data visualization app has also been developed based on Microsoft Excel. The application uses a series of Excel tabs to enter data with one tab per counter ID activity. The application also provides a mechanism to add free text to include open-ended comments of interest that may be acquired during assessments. Two separate summary sheets one for upstream and one for downstream components will automatically display the consolidated results. Next slide, please. The consolidated results use a radar type chart to provide a graphical representation of upstream and downstream maturity. An example of the results is shown on this slide. A table will also provide an automatic summary of the individual maturity levels for each counter ID activity and an overall average for upstream and downstream components. You can see the table to the side of the chart. The output from the self-assessment is an indication of the current maturity level. Next slide, please. I want to conclude this intervention with four key takeaway messages. First, this tool is a product of a collaborative design and a testament to the value of all of us working together. Second, the data visualization app facilitates the collection of data and display of results. Use it. Third, it is a voluntary tool and it is now available in English, French, and Spanish. It is accessible online at unidear.org slash CAD. It is also coming soon in Arabic. And fourth, I encourage you to use the tool to improve preparedness and reach out to us if you need guidance in deploying it. Next slide, please.
to conclude, I stand ready to support our joint efforts and answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much.